The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Catch a creative vibe on the Urban Cube with Sister Shamiza. Good morning and assalamu alaikum. This is Shamiza taking you all the way up to 12 o'clock on the Urban Cube show. The time is 10 o'clock and it's Monday 9th of December and I'm... And I am really pleased to be in your company this morning. I hope you've had a fantastic weekend and having a great start to the week. It is Monday, so it means one thing. I'm all about motivating you and inspiring you with some creativity this morning. I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by some tremendous guests, as always, on the Urban Cube show, inspiring you with their creative journey and also hopefully getting you involved in what some of the projects that they are initiating or maybe going to see one of their productions. Now, the show is The Urban Cube. It goes live and direct on Inspire FM to the wonderful Luton surrounding areas, but also across to Peterborough on um, Salam Radio and also Sheffield on Link FM. So a massive, big, hearty good morning and salam to listeners across Sheffield and Peterborough this morning. It'd always be quite nice to find out if anybody is actually listening in from there. So do contact us if you're listening in to the show, which is the Urban Cube on 07779481822. Would love to find out how you're doing in Peterborough or Sheffield this morning. Now, I am going live from Luton, the Inspire FM studios now. Now, you can actually catch the conversation on the Facebook page, which is only showing the um, Urban Cube screenshot. Um, but you can leave comments on the Facebook page uh, around any of the conversations that we're having today. And it's all about writing, writing for in for books, writing for stage and writing for screen this morning with some absolutely amazing notable guests that I have the absolute privilege of having on the show that are local, national and are internationally recognised this morning as well. So we're in for a bit of a treat. So if you're somebody that's passionate about writing, um, be that writing a novel, a short story or for screen or stage or even for radio, then this is definitely a show for you. Now, guys, do remember that any conversations that are missed, we do have a repeat of the show 8pm this evening on Inspire FM and also a podcast is also released straight off the show. So there's no reason for you to miss any of those conversations. Now coming back to what the content of the show this morning is, I have the absolute pleasure to be joined by a local creative who is has been a regular guest on the show. Her name's uh, Adianka Akarande. She's an actress, she's a film producer, she's a co-founder of the theatre company The Basement Bunch. She's also the producer of the upcoming film Lost Land Girls and she is producing Making Fatiha. Now you might have heard about Making Fatiha because I spoke to um, Fatiha al Gohari, who is um, featured in this really exciting experimental theatre piece produced by Adi, but also Adi Anke, but also um, by Toby Clark as well. So she's going to be talking to us very, very shortly about her writing workshop, which is for young Muslims in Luton, led by comedian Fatia al Ghori, And what um, Adi is going to talk to us about is how that writing is actually going to make its way to the stage. So that's something to keep your ears peeled for. Plus, I'm also joined by Samaya Lee to talk about judging the recent Young Muslim Writers Award 2019. Now, Samaya is a former teacher and author of um, the story of Maha, which was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book and longlisted for the Sunday Times Fiction Award too. Plus, on today's show, we're also joined by the winner of the Artist of the Year, multi-award winning facilitator, TV and film actor. His acting credits include BBC television series The Cops, Spooks, Coronation Street and in the Mike Lee film All or Nothing. He's a teacher and creative producer. His name is Barvez Gadir. He joins me to talk about his groundbreaking projects, Blurred Lines, a short film tackling child criminal exploitation and the dangers of modern slavery is part of the Greater Manchester 
Minister's week of action and exploitation and also crossing the line, a monologue on a tour, which in 20, which is um, on tour up to 2020 and his upcoming project, The Change the Narrative, a film about what it means to be a British Muslim female. Plus, delighted to be joined by Rixana Ahmed later on. She's a notable award-winning playwright, writer and translator whose work has been featured across stage, screen and BBC Radio. Rixana is the co-founder of Carly Theatre Company too. And she'll be speaking to us about her recent theatre play, Homing Birds. All this is happening on today's show. It's jam-packed with some awesome creatives, writers, screen, stage and um, theatre as well. Screen, stage and theatre. Stage and theatre is the same thing, but you know what I'm on about, guys. Screen, stage and also books as well. Lots of advice are going to be giving to you guys if you're a budding writer. Super excited about that. Now, two things that are happening this morning. One is all these awesome guests. The second is it's actually we're running a campaign And the campaign is a good neighbour, be a good neighbour campaign, which we're running across Inspire FM for the next two weeks. Now, the whole purpose of this is kind of get us to know our neighbours a little bit better. That's a good thing, right? Um, And there is actually a prize for any for anybody who can text us in with a wonderful story on how they are engaging with their neighbours. Maybe you're talking to them, maybe you're listening or or just being there to connect. Maybe you've taken their bins out for them or done their shopping. We want to motivate you guys to be great neighbours. We'd love to find out what your story is. Do WhatsApp us on 077 Or maybe you want to take um, some pastry round to them because it is National Pastry Day too. That could be an idea to get talking to your neighbours and um, being a good neighbour. Love to find out from you, even if it's Peterborough Sheffield guys, because you're tuning in from there this morning. Do tell us on 07779481822. But coming back to the show and somebody who I know is a wonderful neighbour, um, but we'll find out from her in a bit more detail. It's no other than the wonderful Adianka Akarande. She is a friend of the show. She's been on the show in the past um, a number of occasions sharing her wonderful creativity across Luton and nationally as well. She's an actress, film producer, co-founder of the theatre company The Basement Bunch. She's also the producer of the very exciting show that's coming to the Hat Factory called Making Fatia. She is today with us to talk to us about a writing workshop for young Muslim writers led by comedian Fatiha al Gohari, and talking to us how you guys can get engaged with this exciting workshop to take your work onto the stage. Sounds exciting, right? Let's find out more. Good morning, Addy. Morning. Hello. That's a lovely sparkly morning. How are you, my darling? <laughs> I'm very, very well, thank you. How are you? I'm super good, super good on this wonderful Monday morning. My dear, you're joining us this morning over the phone to talk to us about some of the amazing work that you're doing, you're bringing to the stage in Luton. But before then, I'm going to take you a little bit back. I want to ask you, being a good neighbour, Addy, are you a good neighbour? I would like to think so, yes. I hope, I hope so. I hope people think I'm a good neighbour. And um, is there anything that you've done that's worthy of texting into the studio to share a story? <laughs> um, I was a bit, it's quite weird, you know, obviously, like, talking about your good deeds because it also makes you seem like, oh, look at me, I'm doing some good deeds. <laughs> hey, why not? But... <laughs> There's a prize in it. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to say, oh... Oh, it's like, what, also, it's like, what is worthy of, like, calling in and sort of, like, you know, I would like to think that on a sort of, like, day-to-day basis, I'm a good neighbour, you know, always sort of, like, looking out for people, something as simple as, like, opening a door or, like, nice. you know, I travel a lot in Lute, um, in London, sorry, so on the tube, Um so, you know, little things like just making sure that someone who needs a seat is able to have a seat mm-hmm. because you'd be surprised at the amount of people who won't actually get up with someone who needs a seat, which is really, really interesting. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'd like to think that, generally speaking, I'm quite a good 
neighbour and person. I like the sound of that. I think I agree. You are, you are. And, but interestingly, these connections that we have with human beings and those people around us is something that you're quite passionate about in your writing. And this connection of communication and making people come together is something that you're actually doing on the stage very, very shortly. It's a piece that's featuring Fatia Al Ghori. Tell us a little bit yeah. more. Um, so it's a very, very exciting piece. Um, we sort of developed the piece actually seeing Fatia perform um, at the Luton Library Theatre um, in March of this year. And absolutely, I just fell in love with her on stage. She's one of the most funniest people I have ever seen perform. So um, Toby Clark, who's the director, mm-hmm. was like, I would love to do a piece on her. So um, they met up once just to have a conversation, just to sort of like get to know her Mm. and everything. Um, And then from there, he sort of like has developed this piece, which is interesting because they actually haven't been in the rehearsal room together. So um, on stage is going to be a very interesting experience because Toby is basically going to pitch a play to Fatia about her faith and about her career um, as a comedian and sort of how um, his views, because he um, could consider himself as um, an atheist, how his views as well sort of impact and underline that. So that's the sort of like performance strand of the project. So that will be very, very interesting. And that's, com- that's coming to Luton um, next year. February the 7th and the 8th and that will be performed at the Hat Factory so that's one strand of the project. Wow, now that strand is very intriguing and it's very yeah. exciting and experimental so anything can yeah. actually happen on that stage and you guys have the confidence to do that which is um, yeah. fascinating <laughs> you trust us so much. Now we had the absolute pleasure of speaking to Fatiha about this and um, she's totally trusting you guys to just let it happen. And I'm absolutely loving that vibe. I'm loving the vibe. And it does go back to this thing about being a good neighbour because it's about conversations, isn't it? It's about knowing Mm. the people around you and making those connections and actually finding out a little bit more because people are quite frightened to actually communicate with those people that they're not familiar with or are slightly different to them. So is this something that you're wanting to kind of motivate and inspire from this show? Yes, 100%. And I think it's, like you said, it's it's really important to have conversations with people, but also just to go beyond that in terms mm. of, like, you know, really, truly understanding, one, not, you know, one another. We always have conversations, whether it's, you know, something on a personal level or mm. whether it's just on the surface. But I think what we lack is that sort of deep understanding and allowing ourselves to be open mm. to receive one another, mm. which is why I think, you know, Theatre particularly, but theatre, film and the arts really allow you to sort of take a seat Mm. and watch and really interact with other people Mm. that aren't, you know, you know, familiar to yourself or similar to yourself. So um, it's really, for me, it's really, really important. And also a lot of magic can happen with Mm. those conversations as well, which is what makes this project really exciting because, you know, Fatia and Toby are quite different Mm. in terms of their beliefs. And let's let's describe them. Let's describe them to the listeners because Fatia is Moroccan hijabi woman, very confident, um, and she's a comedian. Uh, and then we've got uh, Toby. Let let uh, let me allow you to describe him. Toby is. <laughs> so Toby is a uh, middle class, born but working class white man who is a theatre director who's pretty much spent a lot of his life in London mm-hmm. uh, working a lot predominantly in theatre um, and it has an atheist belief. <laughs> wow, what a combination so, on that s- yeah. in that space and lots of interesting conversations are definitely going to be happening. So that's something not to be missed, folks. Tell us again, when is this happening? So this is happening on the 7th and 8th of February. Mm-hmm. Um, it's happening at the Hat Factory uh, in the town centre, Luton Town Centre. Fantastic. So go, if you just go on um, 
the Cultural Trust website, then all the information is on there for you. Wonderful. Now, that's just one of the th- strands of this project. Another strand that you're here to talk to us about, Addy, is the actual writing workshop for young Muslim yes. writers in Luton to actually yes. have their work featured on the stage. That's an opportunity not to be missed. Tell us oh, more. No, not at all. Not at all. Do you know, this is for me. This is the most exciting bit because I also, you know, one of the reasons why I got into the arts as well is also giving other people the opportunity mm, mm. to um, perform and get their work shown. So, as part of the project, um, we are going to be delivering a series of free writing workshops mm-hmm. uh, for young Muslim people in particular in Luton to come along and to um, have some workshops with Satya and potentially Toby as well, um, just to sort of like develop their work, give it a go, uh, maybe try something new. Mm. And if they're feeling up for it and if they're feeling confident enough, then on the Saturday, so the 8th of February, that performance will be an opportunity for them to perform um, a piece of their work. So wow. whether it's spoken word, poetry, maybe it's a screenplay, a mm. snippet of a screenplay or a bit of a theatre show or just, you know, a story, whatever creative writing that they have and that's what they want. They have the opportunity to perform it in front of an audience um, next year. So that's super, super exciting. That is a wonderful opportunity. Now, if you are a upcoming emerging writer or somebody who wants to just have that opening, this is a perfect platform, isn't it, Addy? Yes. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And also an opportunity for you to perform in your hometown, Mm. Um, you know, to perform in your local community. It's very exciting. I mean, it's where I, it's where I started and I just, and uh, which is why I always like to stay, stay in Luton. It's just such a lovely feeling to be able to perform um, in your local community. And what I'm seeing, there's a real emergence of, the audience developing now as well. We're really getting out there and supporting our creativities, especially yeah. the youngsters. And I'm seeing more yeah. and more young people building that confidence from so many different backgrounds now, taking that step, taking that leap now, which is absolutely fantastic. So, Addy, tell me, what is the age range for the participants for this project? So it's um, it's the Young Muslims Writers Workshop led by comedian Fatia al Ghori, also Toby Clark. Um, when does it happen? So it's happening in January. The first session will be happening on the 4th of January mm-hmm. um, and it'll be running um, across the weekend leading up to the show and then we have a few um, sort of like Tuesday evening sessions as well okay. but um, if you drop us an email then we can tell you all the time and the ages for it so we are looking for sort of like 16 plus you know 16 up to 25 mm-hmm. just maybe just under 30 but If you are super interested and super keen and um, you are currently in um, secondary school, so that will be starting from like year seven, so Mm -hmm. if you're sort of like 11, 12 plus and you're super interested, we're more than happy to hear from you as well. You know, we don't want to limit this and we don't want to put a sort of like barrier on it. Mm. Um, So if you're that age group as well and you're interested, then please feel free to um, drop us an email as well. Now, it's a free workshop um, and it's happening yes. in Luton. Age range is 16 to 25, January the 4th. Now, where can folks email you? So, um, they can email us um, on um, our lovely, amazing assistant producer, Sonia, who is um, absolutely incredible um, creative. She's fantastic. So, her email address is Sonia Chowdhury mm-hmm. 107 at gmail.com. So that is Sonia Chowdhury 107 at gmail.com. If you drop her an email, she'll be able to add you to the list and also you can ask her any questions you have about the workshop. Now, coming to Sonia, I know that name, and the reason why I know that name is I think believe she was part of the monologue slam Luton round and uh, she she was also a guest on the show so uh, somebody who I'm really excited to hear more about Addy tell me a little bit more about Sonia um, she's Son- the assist- assistant producer on this this is excellent 
She is. I mean, Sonia is just an incredible young woman. Um, she is a fantastic um, actor as well. Like you said, she was a monologue slam, and she's absolutely um, brilliant. Um, but Sonia's been a really integral part of the project, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, she's given ideas and suggestions Fantastic. and she's very keen to develop the art scene in Luton as mm. well. She's very, very passionate. Um, so she's actually leading on the recruitment of um, the uh, workshops and she'll be also um, inputting on the workshops as well. So there might be a section where Sonia will be um, leading the writing workshops as well because she's a very talented writer. But I'm very excited to work with her as well. I mean, I'm learning just as much from her as uh, much as she says she's learning from me. So she's a very, very exciting individual to look out for in the future. Now, Addy, what I find so extraordinary about you is you're still a young, you're still very young yourself, but your, your track <laughs> record, your portfolio of creativity has been so exceptional. You, you have already made your mark in London, you're working there, but you still come back to the town considering you're a producer, a director, an actress, a writer, you've co-founded a theatre company, The Basement Bunch, but you still want to come back to Luton. Why? Because I love it. I love Luton. I really, really do. And like, there's something really exciting about Luton where there is so much creative potential in the town like it's just bubbling over mm. that thing I think for me it would be ridiculous not to be a part of that mm. and I think people do get lost in this idea that we've been told that you know this, these big cities like London and New York and like America like you know that's where you need to be for for the arts and it's like it's really not true if you look in your town you will find some exceptional talent and mm. that's what's happening in Luton, which is why I love, love, love being here and I don't think I'll be leaving for a very, very long time. That's so wonderful to hear and very, very inspiring. And what's so exciting is all these pockets of projects that yes. are, you know, I can't keep up, Addy. How can I, you know, keep, <laughs> how can listeners actually keep up with what's going on in the town? Because there's something happening every yes. week. Every week yeah. there's something. So there's no reason for anybody to say that there's nothing to get enga engaged with. Exactly. There's so much happening. I mean, like the Cultural Trust, which was um, formerly known as Luton Culture, they've constantly got so much happening. Um, I'm pretty sure as well, I think they, they themselves, they have something happening every week. You know, mm. they've got the Christmas show happening really soon, which is always fantastic. Um, and then you've got Revolution Arts as well. They've got projects, NGYT, um, so much happening all the time. And it's very, very, very exciting. It's a very, very exciting time to be in Luton. Especially if you're somebody that's creative, who's interested in theatre, exactly. arts, yeah. writing, acting. Luton's the place for you. I'm quite envious because I wish I had these opportunities whilst I was growing up. But then there's no age limit because there are lots of other no. projects that are over 25 plus as well. Tomorrow, um, tomorrow we're going to be seeing the Butterfly Project. This is 16 Days of Activism. It's a UN-led human rights initiative. The last 16 days where um, creatives are coming together to showcase uh, artistry around and uh, violence against women and girls. Mariam Grillo is going to be showcasing um, a fantastic uh, section of this at the Hat Factory um, tomorrow evening. So do go on to um, the Luton Co the Cultural Trust website to check out further information. Now, coming back to you, um, Addy, I want to ask you about the Lost Land Girls because um, yeah. <laughs> you are the producer of this fantastic film. When is it going to be released? When do we get to see it? Yeah, so um, we are planning, so I did the um, short film with my amazing friend Shakira, who's a fantastic um, writer and director as well, so she wrote it. Um, so the film is actually going to be screened, fingers crossed, um, in sort of March next year, because um, the project was funded by the BFI, which is, which is the um, British Film Institute, mm. and it was funded as part of their South East Hub 
region. Mm -hmm. So there's about eight of us in the region that were funded. So the plan is to sort of wait for all the films to be completed um, and then have a massive screening at the BFI in London in March. How exciting. So we were one of the first people to finish, which was very, very exciting. So we're just waiting for everyone else to finish. And then that should be screened um, in March um, at the BFI. So once those details are out, oh, it will be free as well. So once the details are out, um, I'll let you know. And we would love to see as many Luton faces of course. as possible. If not, we'll hold a nice little private screening, again, free of charge, oh. just for the Luton lot. Just for <laughs> us lot. Sounds brilliant. Just Thank you lot. so much, Addy, for joining us this morning and sharing with us this Thank really you. exciting workshop, which is happening on um, January the 4th. Um, Yep, and I'll be giving more information about that after the break. Now, we are heading off to a break, and I'm going to have to say goodbye to Addy for joining us this morning. Thank you so very much, Addy. Thank you. No worries. I've had a lovely time on the show, as always. <laughs> take care. Take care. Have a brilliant day. That was a wonderful Addy from me. We're heading off to a break, and after break, joined by some more absolutely fantastic creative guests. Assalamu alaikum. Inspire FM. a creative vibe on the Urban Cube with Sister Shamiza. Good morning and assalamu alaikum. It is 10.30 Monday 9th of December and I'm Shamiza taking you all the way up to 12 o'clock on the Urban Cube brought to you on Inspire FM. Now this is a show that celebrates creativity locally, nationally and internationally and an opportunity for you to hear their journeys and the journeys of artists, uh, writers, poets, theatre makers and creative pioneers on the show. Now we have great pleasure in speaking to not just local artists but also local creative but also national as well. On the show today I'm going to be joined by three other guests who are going to be joining me not just from London but also all the way up from Rochdale this morning too so do listen in to those interviews that are happening today. Now if you miss any of the conversations don't worry you can catch them on the repeat of the show 8pm and also on the podcast that is always released straight after as well. Now, today's show, um, as promised, I'm going to be joined by some tremendous guests who I hope will motivate you, inspire you to pick up the pen. So if you're a budding writer and enjoy the thought or aspire to become a writer, be that for uh, be that writing a novel, putting a poem together or creating a screen play, then I'm sure you're going to really enjoy and be inspired by the fantastic guests that I have this morning. I have the absolute pleasure of uh, speaking to one tremendous creative, a writer who is not just nationally recognised, but her work has been received internationally internationally as well. She is an award-winning writer. Um, she is somebody whose work I am really inspired by and I have followed for many a year. She is a notable award-winning playwright, writer and translator whose work has been featured across the stage, screen and BBC radio. She's also the co-founder of Carly Theatre Company and um, Saturday saw the showcase of a wonderful theatre piece that has been hard, well has received critical acclaim for the story, and it was called the homing. Sorry, it was called the homing um, birds, which uh, has been showcased ac- across the country, and it follows the journey of a young man who has refugee status, and it's a really inspiring story of of connection and communication and family and understanding and not knowing what the future holds as well. Something that, a storyline that many of us can possibly relate to and can possibly understand or have sympathy for. And it really kind of relates to today's topic where we're we're running a campaign called A Good Neighbour. And the whole purpose of A Good Neighbour campaign is to really connect with those of us that we don't normally speak to or just really kind of embody making those conversations. Now, if you're somebody that is uh, uh, is 
somebody that is, do, does this on a regular basis, why not share your story with us? We'd love to find out from you. And now I'm coming back to my absolutely wonderful guest who I have great pleasure in speaking to this morning. Just want to share a little bit more about her work. I've already mentioned she's a playwright, a writer and translator. Her stage plays include Song for, San- Song for a Sanctuary, Gatekeeper's Wife, River on Fire, Mistaken, Um, her BBC radio work, besides originals, she's adapted Noel L. Sadwi's Women at Point Zero, Jean Rye's Wide Saragoso Sea, um, R.K. Narayan's The Guide, even Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children. Screenplays include Cassandra and Viaduct on the BBC, Amal's Story, R. See films. The list is endless. She's also done her, a, a novel, which is a fiction novel called The Hope Chest, and her anthology, The Gatekeeper's Wife, are both highly regarded. Her short stories have appeared in anthologies around the world, and she's also um, received awards for many of the works that she's done. For example, River on Fire finalist. Um, Susan Smith Blackburn International Award, Writers, Writers Guild Award for Best Radio Adaptation, Song for a Sanctuary finalist, Cree Award and Best Original Drama, plus nomination for Susan Smith Black, uh, Blackburn International Award. Now, you can understand why I'm super excited to speak to Roxana Rik- because she's somebody that really inspires me. And I'm, s- and especially being on the radio and the work that she's done on radio, I have the absolute pleasure of welcoming Roxana Ahmed on the show this morning. Assalamu alaikum, Roxana. Assalamu alaikum, Shamaiza. Nice to meet you on radio. A pleasure to be acquainted with you as well, Roxana. Firstly, congratulations for the wonderful accolades um, that you've received over the many years of your work, which is a real testament to your talent and creativity and has really thoroughly inspired me um, whilst I've been at college and university just observing your work. But I'm really quite taken aback by your new piece, at, uh, which was featured at Tara, the Tara um, Theatre, and it's Homing Birds, um, a beautiful piece. Um, thank you so much for that lovely and generous introduction. Shamaiza, you've been very generous with your adjectives. <laughs> I don't feel that um, successful, but I have had a wonderful career over the years. I've worked very hard. Um, and Kali Theatre Company is a great pride and joy to mm. me now that I've come back to it. Um, it was co-founded um, with me um, by Rita Wolf, mm-hmm. who was an actor um, uh, whom some people will remember, I think, from her early days in Coronation mm. Street and my beautiful laundry. Yes. Um, but then she left and I was left to manage the company. And uh, I'm relieved to say that I delivered that responsibility reasonably well so that we got revenue and funding about 2002 mm-hmm. or three. And I left the company then. And I, it gave me great pleasure when they invited me back to do a piece for them. Um, I'm very pleased with the reception of Homing Birds mm. and really um, happy with how it was executed. It was a wonderful production with a great set, lovely sound design, lovely lighting, wonderful acting. And um, I think everything sang for a change um, it is difficult to get a production that you're happy with, so I'm really happy that we achieved this with the, with this play. With tremendous accolade as well, the reviews have been absolutely fantastic about homing birds. What was the inspiration behind this piece? Um, really, it was my um, attempt to understand the differences around immigration. Mm-hmm and the horror of the debates that were going Mm. around as much as it was also my horror of war. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a fairly strongly anti-war person, Mm -hmm. and um, initially the the Seed Commission was for a season of war plays that Carly had planned. Carly Theatre Company's artistic director, Helena Bell, had invited a writer from Afghanistan. Um, Well, she's um, somebody who's a Guardian journalist, Nadine Pori, mm-hmm. uh, and she's 
co-authored uh, a book with uh, a gentleman called Gulwali Pasarle, who came as an asylum seeker himself mm-hmm. and uh, has successfully settled in England. Um, and I was very moved by the story, The Lightless Sky, but also deeply moved by the story of Fawzia Kufi, who's an Afghan politician. This is a biography that Nadine has written uh, for Fawzia Kufi, and it is very impressive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I decided to create fictional characters based on these two real people whose lives are um, really an example of success. We tend to have misery stories too mm-hmm. often, and I decided it would be nice to do something um, that that would um, show people in real life, mm-hmm. not necessarily as victims, but as agents. And um, I am very happy that this, as the play grew, the story, the characters took over, and the story evolved in a good way. Um, and I uh, think everybody has relished the character of the politician Rabia Birani in the in the play hugely. How, where did um, the writing inspiration come from? Was this something that was presented to you as a young child or did, or did you grow with your interest in writing the older you got? Um, <clears throat> basically, um, I grew up at a time when there was no television and uh, no telephones and no internet to distract us and we read a lot. That's, that sounds like a wonderful place to be. <laughs> it was indeed. It was indeed. We had few toys. Um, I come from a fairly modest background. We weren't poor. I can't pretend that we were poor, but we were um, always um, stretched for resources, I think, is the mm-hmm. right word. Um, and we had large um, <coughs> connected families, you know, cousins mm-hmm. and extended families where you played quite a lot with cousins and talked books a mm. lot. And I decided quite early that I wanted to be a writer, but I was quite shy to admit it until university days, um, much, which was much later. But I read uh, quite avidly in both Urdu and English, mm-hmm. uh, and quite precociously, I think. <laughs> so, um, yes, I suppose I attempted a novel at the age of 12 or 13, but uh, it never got very far, maybe 26, 27 pages. Bless, but that's, that's a lot of pages for a 12 or 13 year old to be writing. And, and did your family nurture your passion for writing? Um, I think they did. They did feel very proud of it. Uh, they would encourage me to enter essay competitions and uh, story competitions. And I remember doing some translations at university. I studied English literature rather than Urdu literature, but Mm -hmm. I was quite a fluent reader of Urdu, and I still love Urdu literature. Mm -hmm. That's why my translations have been from Urdu to Mm -hmm. English, because I wanted to share that pleasure. I'm Um, finding a revival for the interest in Urdu kind of developing uh, across the country. Um, And it was interesting because I had a a wonderful um, author friend come tell me uh, who's actually come from Pakistan to England that in Pakistan there doesn't seem to be that much of an interest across the youth. Um, in Urdu? In Urdu, or yeah. Uh, well, it's not majority language there, but mm-hmm. I think there is. Um, I would contest that there is a reasonable amount of interest. Mm-hmm. It's just that um, not being a majority language, it has been difficult for Urdu uh, literature to be appreciated right. as fully. But at the same time, the, the greatest proponents of Urdu have also been from the Punjab. So if you look at the poetry of Faiz Ahmed Faiz mm-hmm. or Iqbal or um, um, more recently Kishwar Nahid, people like that uh, who settled in the Punjab or were of Punjabi origin, um, you realize, uh, also, if you look at Ahmed uh, Faraz, for example, was from the frontier. Mm-hmm. So there is a wide universal audience for Urdu, and it is the lingua franca in Pakistan. Everybody, it's the common language for the nation, mm-hmm. it's the national language. So everybody does love it to an extent as well. It's just that people feel very challenged with their pronunciation right. questions, and I think that is always a deterrent. I mean, I know 
that um, all non-native Urdu speakers are often criticized for their accents and they, are, they become quite shy about speaking it. I want Do you know what I mean? Yes, no, I agree with you. Um, I was going to say something in order and I thought, no, my accent may, <laughs> may let me down, so I'm not going to now. Um, oh, no, 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 please don't feel that. I'm a great <laughs> proponent of um, uh, speech as communication. Mm-hmm. It, the accent is secondary. Right. Really, I mean, if you think about it, not many of us speak English perfectly. There are so few people who can achieve, receive pronunciation, uh-huh. and who wants to speak Oxford English anyway? <laughs> I think we should own it the way we want to speak it. As long as we're saying nice things, that's the most important thing that matters. Oh. Folks, if you've just tuned in, you are listening to The Urban Cube with Misha Miser, taking you all the way up to 12 o'clock this morning. Uh, the time is 10.44, and I have the absolute pleasure to be joined by no other than Ruxana Ahmed. Now, Ruxana Ahmed is an award winning playwright, um, writer, translator. She's a somebody whose work I followed for many a year. She co-founded um, Kali Theatre and it's an absolute pleasure to have her on the show this morning sharing her journey but also talking to us about this fantastic play called Homing Birds um, which is is a play that I hope more people will be able to get to see. I think the has the tour ended with this play? Um, or, yes. And will it, it continue or will we be getting to see um, this play again? Well, the text exists, Mm -hmm. and uh, I think nobody can rule out revivals. Um, So I'm optimistic that there will be more interest in it. On the last night, I had a couple of people who were talking about um, trying to put it on elsewhere. So let's hope something like that happens, Um, because it really did get a good reception, and audiences uh, were reluctant to get out, who are reluctant to get out of London also made it, which mm. is nice. You mm. know, when I say London, I mean central London, because Sala Arts is not that far out. It's mm-hmm. southwest 18, uh, easily accessible by trains mm-hmm. from Waterloo. But uh, all of us are quite addicted to the underground uh, and find it much easier to get to destinations that are on the underground. So maybe that and the train strike uh, might have... Uh, been uh, off-putting for people, but still lots of people came and they were wonderful um, audiences who were really enthused by the play. What were you hoping um, would have been achieved from this play for those people that had come to watch it, The Homing Birds? Um, I hope a level of empathy for mm. people who are put in this plight of becoming refugees. Mm. I hope a level of understanding of uh, women's um, plight in um, patriarchal society. Mm-hmm. I hope also a level of revulsion against war mm-hmm. because I think all those are quite strong themes in the play. Mm-hmm. Now, this is something that you're very passionate about showcasing because there's other work that you've done around the theme of war and women, from what I recall. Um, and is this something, is this like the main theme of your writing? It's so difficult to know what your main theme is because mm-hmm. I think as a writer you are less engaged by themes than by stories and characters. And that's what usually drives your vision. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think ultimately we all have a vision of the world and I suppose mine is one that believes in bridges, making mm-hmm. bridges mm-hmm. across communities. So although I haven't written about war in such a serious way as I have done in this play Mm -hmm. before now, I have written about divisions Mm -hmm. quite a lot. So River on Fire dealt with the communal divisions in Bombay Mm -hmm. or Mumbai, as we like to call it now, um, in the 90s. And there were bombings which began around the Barbary Mosque theme. Um, and the, that dispute has continued. Mm. Um, and I think a uh, mistaken Annie Besant in India looks at the partition uh, situation and the Jallianwala Bag massacre featured in the play. So um, I think, I suppose, violence is something that bothers me because mm. I hate uh, wasted lives. Um, I think violence and war waste. Uh, young blood and young talent uh, and can be devastating, particularly for parents and for 
wives and for children who lose out to their parents and become orphans. So it's um, one of the themes that does occupy me quite a lot. <laughs> And underst- understandably, because it's an opportunity to kind of share your views with the world, and with an audience that is willing to listen and observe and learn from the atrocities that are happening around the world. Do you feel stage theatre, writing and creativity or art itself is a wonderful tool to bridge that gap of understanding? Um, I think so. I think um, what interests me most about human beings is their capacity for love and Mm. um, their innate desire for justice. I believe in that. So I think um, if people hear the story that moves them, um, it does does shift points of view. Mm. I don't think that writers can completely change the world, but they can um, lead people to an understanding of the context of different people's Mm. conditions and lives. And um, they do um, breed, if you like, more harmony, I hope. They can. They're capable of, equally as they are capable of inciting hatred and division. So um, I think I'd like to say that I on the side of harmony and peace. And may it continue. May your writing writing keep flowing this uh, love for humanity on those wonderful pages. I sounded so poetic, didn't I, Rixana? Uh, I want to ask you, Rixana, um, what is your favourite genre? Is it po- oh gosh. <laughs> poetry? It is, is it theatre, playwright, a screen? What is it? I think um, I I enjoy working in various genres. I've not been very um, committed to any single one. Uh, I think writers have more control over fiction, and it's a great pleasure to do fiction. But um, theatre is a collaborative art form, Mm. and it's such a pleasure working with others that I have enjoyed it the most, I think. Um, And I think uh, this return to the theatre was interesting. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of screenplays, before this, in this period between the 2005 and now. But um, that can be um, quite lonesome in a sense that there is no immediate gratification. Right. And uh, with theatre there is, as you see the product, uh, there is a great pleasure and joy of working with others. And also the security of working with others. And what so maybe I'm coming out in favor of screenplay of theater rather than screenplays at the moment. And we're seeing a, a real emergence of now BAME actors, sorry, writers, and especially Asian women coming forward and 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 writing for theater. Um, and how does that make you feel when you see an emergence of new writers coming forward? I feel very proud of what Carly has achieved mm. because we've had, I think, uh, over 80 writers go through Carly, mm. uh, which is an amazing figure because Carly does a lot of Carly Theatre Company mm-hmm. has single-handedly seen um, so many Asian women writers. It was founded um, originally to produce a play of mine, but we kept it alive because oh, wow. we thought that there were not enough um, Asian women writing uh-huh. for the theatre. So the idea was that we would help them to get the art form under their belt. Mm. It does require the experience mm-hmm. and the craft skills to develop right. uh, before you can achieve huge successes in theatre. And if you are coming to it from your study rather than from the stage, uh, it's much harder um, because obviously a lot of uh, playwrights uh, who emerge are from an acting background. They have mm-hmm. a better understanding, mm-hmm. but a lot of Asian women do not uh, have that opportunity. So it has been great to have been of assistance to them. And Carly is still forever finding new writers with our discovery programs. Then we have rehearsed readings of works that are in development and then they're taken to workshop stage then whatever is picked is rigorously developed with the help of a dramaturg. Uh, Dramaturgy is really important as well. I myself was very privileged to work with Suzanne Bell, a wonderful dramaturg um, who works with the Manchester Royal Exchange Theatre and uh, 
uh, Helena Bell, my director, uh, both, all three of us um, looked at every draft very carefully and made the changes. Um, I suppose helped, they, they guided me to find the story as um, it would be in its most meaningful form mm, mm. for me. I don't feel I didn't feel at any point that I was pushed in a specific direction, but I was made to uh, see where the editing was needed, mm. which was really helpful. So all of these things matter when it comes to theatre writing, and I feel very proud of our own achievement in that respect. And of course, there are women who are talented who will produce work, whether or not they've been part of Kali or not. But we have worked with almost all of the major playwrights mm. that you see around now. Which is really wonderful to hear, and especially uh, the, the way Carly has supported for, supported not just yourself, but many other writers too, and may continue to do so. Would it be possible to find out how people can contact Carly Theatre if there are any emerging writers um, listening in who want to be part of the Discovery Programme or any other programmes or get on an, a mailing list for Carly Theatre? Oh, it's very simple. We have a website, uh, www.carlytheatre.com, I think it is. Just Google Carly Theatre Company and it will come up. Um, uh, we have a Facebook page. It's Carly Theatre UK. Uh, Facebook.com Carly Theatre UK. Um, or you can email Carly at info at carlytheatre.co.uk. Thank you so um, so do 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 uh, encourage people to respond. Definitely. Thank you. thank you so very much, Rixana Ahmed, for joining me this morning. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for giving us some great tips on how to kind of develop your theatre writing career with Carly Theatre too. It's, it's awesome. Thank you, Shamaiza. Lovely to speak to you. And you too. That was the absolutely wonderfully talented Roxana Ahmed on the show this morning. And I'm heading off to a break and we're joined by another fantastic theatre maker, facilitator and actor, Bravez Gardir, on the show just straight after this. You're listening to an Inspire FM podcast, making available our popular programmes from our daily broadcast on Inspire FM. Catch a creative vibe on the Urban Cube with Sister Shamiza. Hey, good morning. It's 11 o'clock, Monday 9th of December, and you're listening to me, Shamiza, taking you all the way up to 12 o'clock this morning on Where Else? Inspire FM, of course. It's the Urban Cube show. And today I've had the absolute pleasure of getting to talk to some tremendous guests about writing writing and theatre. I had the pleasure of speaking to Addy this morning, Addy Akarende, who was talking to me about a fantastic opportunity for emerging writers, emerging writers, anybody who has an interest in writing, who's young and Muslim age, 16 to 25, then you have the opportunity to participate in a writing workshop led by no other than the com comedic giant herself, Fatia al Ghuri. She will be leading the workshop with Toby Clark and also Sonia Chowdhury. And this is happening on January the 4th. So that's an opportunity for anybody who's interested in writing. Now, um, I am going to be joined by another fabulous guest who think, I think is going to inspire you, motivate you to get your pens out and writing um, to as well. Now, this guest, um, I'm really quite excited to introduce because I have watched him and many of a TV serial whilst growing up. Um, he is the winner of the Artist of the Year. He's a multi-award winning facilitator, TV and film actor. His acting credits include the BBC television series, The Cops, Spooks, which was my favourite, Coronation Street, and even in the Mike Lee film, All or Nothing. But it's not that what we're going to be talking about, folks. We're going to be talking slightly a little bit about that, but more so about his role as a creative producer um, and about his groundbreaking projects, once called Blurred Lines. It's a short film tackling child criminal exploitation and the dangers of modern slavery. And this was part of Greater Manchester's Week of Action on Exploitation. 
Plus, we're also going to be talking to him about Crossing the Line, which is a monologue um, which went on tour in 2019. And his upcoming project, Change the Narrative, a film about what it means to be a British Muslim female. I'm sure you're curious to hear a lot more. So absolutely delighted to have Bravis Kader joining us all the way from Rochdale this morning. Assalamu alaikum, Bravis. Uh, well, I can slam. Wow, that's some introduction. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> Thank well, that, you for that. That's, that's not even half of it. I've got <laughs> two pages spanning oh. of over, say, 20 yeah. years of your wow. absolutely phenomenal career, Boris. Mashallah, mashallah. But we're going to go back slightly um, yeah. and um, just ask you the the acting side of your work um tell us a little bit more when did the acting bug begin um oh god i think quite from an early age uh, from watching uh, bollywood films hollywood films i was just really fascinated about the mechanics um i do remember quite an early memory um my older brother um telling me quite in his abrupt way a uh, typical older brother we always used to get into scrapes i couldn't work out like in the films when people die did they actually die and so i asked him and uh, he told me they're acting and then he gave me a good tupper after that <laughs> so I, and then quite quickly the the school of hard knocks came to me quite quickly so i was just fascinated about how that whole worked and i didn't have the confidence growing up to tell my parents look I want to pursue, sort of pursue a career performing arts because mm. there was nobody doing that in my kind of area. There was no one that looked like me on the screen or unless they were in sort of like Bollywood films. Right. So it took me a lot of confidence. So it was about 15, 16, when academically I wasn't the most astute student. Right. But I did like creative writing and English. And then eventually I kind of had the confidence to my mum was always the broker in, in in that home if you could get mum on your side usually dad would be on my side as well so i said look i want to pursue this kind of performing arts she thought it might have been a fad or something that i might just get over and i didn't know that it was something i wanted to do but uh, that's how i kind of started it really didn't do anything beforehand that was quite late whereas a lot of young people might go to a stage Mm -hmm. so that's how i first got the bug and that bug has not stopped. It's uh, continued for many a year ahead. And mashallah, you've gone on to feature in quite yeah. well-known um, productions on television um, from the Cops, Spooks, Coronation Street. Yeah. You've even featured in Hollywood too. Um, what's been your favourite moment in your acting career? Um, I, think, I think when you mention the Cops, and people probably won't remember that, but it's on YouTube. I do. You, you Google it. But... Um, that, I mean, that was made sort of like that sort of like late late 90s right. and it was a very documentary style mm, of filming mm. and I think it was done by um, uh, Tony Garnett who worked a lot with Mike Lee like on Kez, he mm-hmm. was the producer on that. So I remember knowing about Tony Garnett, he's come up with this, he did something before that called This Life which is about students living in London. Mm. So at that time, he was making groundbreaking TV, and this was, like, totally unheard of in the sense that it was going to look very documentary stylish, and where the camera was, it was going to be hidden, so you didn't have to work towards the camera. It was all about the scene. Mm. I remember we went out with the police just to kind of know what it was like. We went out with the police for a couple of weeks, and then once the the police had seen what the scripts were like, they soon detached themselves from it, because it showed the police as warts and all, that, Mm -hmm. like everything else, they they have their um, um, flaws, Right. so we say. Uh, But yeah, it was hard-hitting. It it was gripping. I remember it being gripping whilst watching it, um, and it was kind of... a proud moment. Very proud moment. But, you know, that's not just... That's not the only proud moment you've had. You know, you have worked um, as a professional actor for more than yeah. fifteen years, and you've been in yeah. two twice um, in uh, twice in a BAFTA award-winning drama series. But what's really quite extraordinary is the fact that your passion for being in front of the screen—you've now kind of gone behind the screen, and you're actually yeah. you became a teacher of performing arts. Um, yeah. What made you want yeah. to teach? Young um, people or so adults. If anyone goes in, in, in this career, it is a quite a hard career as mm-hmm. well. Just 
financially because you're kind of the, the phrase that they say is like any one time 90% of actors are out of work which is right. so true because okay. the the window of opportunity is like a lottery to call mm. it a career so mm. there would be moments where I wasn't working and that's when you'd get friends saying oh it's not like a proper job which I kind of understood from their perspective because it wasn't like typical nine to five I knew where the wage packet was coming so there'd be periods where you could earn quite a bit and then you might not be working right. for like four or five months just because the way it went mm. so you, I quite quickly had to think of other skills so one of the things I quite learned was learning when I was doing theatre or TV the skills what it was to devise so I kind of just put myself out there I mm. kind of was making it up as I was going along to be honest and people got to me and always oh can you do a workshop with this creative group or we've got an adult group and mm. so that's what I was sort of doing while I was doing the acting but then I started to enjoy that quite a lot uh, so and then I kind of got into thinking, right, I might as well get a formal qualification while I was still juggling the acting. And then you get to a point where I think, I think I've gone as far as I can with the acting. Also because of the way you look, you're often cast in that right. way and that's mm. often the narrative. And I wasn't quite happy the way that was going. So you'd often, which is stereotypical, you'd hear you'd play the stereotypical Asian part mm -hmm. or, or you'd reinforce the stereotype, which I wasn't happy about. So I had a very supportive agent who understood that I was saying no a lot. And it just got to a point where I think, you know what, I'm saying no a lot. I think I'm not enjoying that aspect of mm. it, but I still enjoy the process of making drama and working with people who probably, I don't, maybe that isn't their dream or want to be, but they want to go on a creative process. So that's what, where that kind of transition happened, if that makes sense. And it's been wonderful to observe your, you evolving as an actor and now becoming a facilitator and a creative yes. producer. Yeah. And yeah. this creative the creative producing side of your work, a martial art has um, won you an Thank award you. as well. So you're a multi-award winning facilitator. How does it sound when it's said out like that you to you? It, you have to think of a word of what I do. I, there's a combination <laughs> of skills and anyone that's going into this field you know that uh, one skill set often isn't enough. Of so course. I knew the sort of the acting side. I knew the sort of the camera side because I'd watch people. I knew how they sort of set up a producer, what their role was just to make sure the whole machinery worked. Mm. So you can't, you know, without standing like, you know, I'm, I'm jack of all trades, but you just have to have a lot of skill set. So but I'm you are, though. Hide... You are like <laughs> jazz of all trades. Did you get it? Well, that was one of your characters yeah, that you played. That is. Boom, well boom. Done. Sorry. Well done. Well done. <laughs> I've been yeah, doing my research. <laughs> You have, um, you have to have all those. Mm. You can't even think of a term without sounding like, you know, with a big ego, and that's not that's not me. So a creative facilitator, I think that's a great way to facilitate people on a process of course. to enjoy or bridge the gap between them from starting to the end product. Mm -hmm. I kind of facilitate that, though. There's lots, lots and lots of roles in that. Facilitating, bringing people together yeah. um, is yeah. something that you're passionate about because your work is engaging young people in the community yeah. and bringing communities together and this is what you've been awarded for um yeah. for your facilitation um and um mashallah the work that um has you've been acknowledged for is yeah. part of your groundbreaking projects blurred lines and blurred yeah. lines is a short film tackling child criminal exploitation and the dangers of right. modern slavery now, this is yeah. quite a heavy topic um, to be working around. Why did you feel you needed to do a film around this? So often um, people will come up to be uh, or, or commissioners, say, from the school or private or public sector because they've heard of things I do. So often that's where the work comes. It's often very rare that I will devise a project myself. Okay. I've done that a couple of times. Well, people often come with me and say, we know about your process, which is often to work with a group of young people through mm -hmm. a process, and at the end of it, you'll have a resource. Mm -hmm. um, that's in simple terms what I kind of do. So on this, uh, Gail Hopper, who's the Director of Children's Services for uh, Rochdale Council, uh, came up to me about a couple of years ago and said, look, do you know anything about county lines? And I didn't, I didn't know the term county lines, but when she explained it, it just reminded me of what Fagin was doing, you know, in like Charles mm -hmm. Dickens and Alan yeah. Swift. Um, so it's been around for a long, long time, but it currently... At the moment, it's uh, it's very organised. It's organised criminal gangs where they um, exploit and groom young people. Some cases, as young as seven or eight, goodness me, to transport drugs. Mm -hmm. And county lines is basically going from one area to another, and that could be in their own area. So it's a different ward. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody from London going mm -hmm. all the way to Liverpool or further afield. 
So she wanted to counter that quite quickly by having a, a school resource. Um, so she targeted a school that we wanted to work at. Often the young people that I work with not often uh, affiliated with that. These mm-hmm. are young people who want to go on a process, a creative process. So the young people that are in the film are often people who haven't done drama before. Mm-hmm. But I work with them for about a period of eight months who usually meet once a week and we will tackle all the themes around it. They'll have the support, there'll be a teacher there all the time and then we'll find a way through that by, which is all my expertise, what I've done in the past films, like what Mike Lee does, he devises, he comes up with characters, they'll act out scenarios and then eventually, it's like a sieve, some mm. ideas will just be really strong and then I'll develop that with the young people. So what is great as well, because it's come from Rochdale and uh, Rochdale often and lots of other towns have been branded with the whole grooming uh, case that happened about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. What's good about Rochdale is like, actually we're not going to hide, we're going to uh, tackle it up front right. and we're going to tackle and inform our young people to be aware. So that's where this came about. And the the project is continuous and how has the response yeah. been to this project and where what's the next stage so we were really fortunate once we were making the film film and once the first edit had come out gail was really pleased with it she informed greater manchester police greater manchester police got involved quite quickly and said look this should be part of the um sort of child criminal exploitation week which was about mm. a couple of months ago mm. so it went on a road show all across greater manchester wow. now the film is because it's once it's out there on youtube it has a life of its own yes um so it, it's based at um rochdale council website which it also has lesson plans um so we get every so often i'll get an email or a text from someone who's watched it in new york or australia or something saying thank you for putting this how does out. that make you feel when you get uh, correspondence from across the world, you know, because Ro- Roch- and, and Rochdale is on the map for something else. <laughs> you know, what's great about sort of when I started this uh, kind of world of, uh, say, acting or, or just being creative, I think it was just like there wasn't that many channels. Uh, social media hadn't exploded. Mm. Uh, your accessibility to make them and put it out quite quickly on, on, online. And now things you, you, you are so accessible so quickly mm. and so immediate, which is great. And this is how these young people communicate is through that, through Snapchat. Yes, or, it is, yeah. Right? So, so they're very tech-savvy mm. compared to where I was when I was growing up. So it, it's great that the film it just disseminates and disseminates and disseminates and what was also really good about this when we took it out on the road show we got family and parents and carers watching the film right. because that's another thing parents and gatekeepers mm. to young people so they kind of the eyes and ears mm. so they were educated as well so they could have that conversation with young people as well so it's it being not just about young people it's about parents and being involved in the in the discussion which is so important because that's how you build strengthen and yeah. protect communities when everybody comes together and actually yeah. has and voices what's concerning them but you're also yeah. giving that voice back to the young people because this is what your work is about it's about yeah. um you describe it as working with people from different walks of life and helping them to yeah. unlock their unique yeah. voices by providing yeah. them with a platform to be heard now that platform what are those platforms that you want to kind of get young people on and to be heard, Pervis? So um, the mediums I often work in is film. I've done theatre and mm-hmm. animation. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I will, what I ideally want, I just want young people to enjoy creativity because mm. often they will, say if it's a school setting, they've come out of their normal school timetable to be part of this. They still have to do the other lessons, mm. uh, but they'll be in their own time. So... I said to like the fact that you you're going to buy into this, you're sacrificing a lot because you're going to have to do extra work by keeping up with them other lessons. Mm-hmm. This is about you enjoying your process. And often the young kids that are together working, they don't know each other. Often they're from different year groups. So it's about them working together like a cohesive group. Mm-hmm. And what you want to grow from that is their confidence to be able to be, be able to communicate and you know just those, those skills of learning how to script right uh to to act mm-hmm. to, to know what a crew's like what it's like to produce and then often we put our films at Odeon. we the Odeon buy into what we do Fantastic. so we always have a film premiere and for them to see one group one young kid said last week i was here i was watching avengers this week it's my film wow so you can tell like that's so empowering for that young person to feel like you have the power to, to, to have a strong voice. Mm. So, yeah, so that's where that comes from. How exciting. Was there a red carpet there as well? Did they um, walk down it? 
We we have only had the red carpet once, unfortunately. But we all, often get sometimes the schools will all buy in and get a limo for the young people. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, they'll get a limo and there'll be a photographer. We had uh, local news on the on blurred lines, so they were on the news, local news, ITV news. So they, they're starting to have a nice ripple effect about what we're doing in in Rochdale. Like I said, it starts with Rochdale, but these resources, these films, are for anyone. So how use. can people access these resources? Because this. There, yeah. there, it isn't a problem. Child exploitation. It's not yeah. just Rochdale yeah. across the country. Yeah. We do uh, have issues of gang violence and knife crime, and we're hearing stories yeah. every single day. Unfortunate <laughs> stories, unfortunate losses, and it just feels yeah. that. How can we manage this? How can we change the landscape for young people so that that, that youth culture is a safe space? Um, mm. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, all these questions. It, who has it, the answers? It, it, no, I don't. I wish. I wish. All, all I can, all I can do is offer, um, um, uh, whether it's film or theatre, uh, a safe place to have a debate, mm. have a discussion, uh, and be informed on some of the myths. So, some something like um, blurred lines or the the monologue, which I've written called "Crossing the Line." Mm. Um, it's about taking away the glamour of what young people might think that's great because someone's earning X amount or that person's got a flash car or Mm. that person is flashing the cash. But actually there there is a darkness to that. You will Mm. never acquire that, you know. So it's about making young people feel able to have those discussions Mm. Uh, and parents as well because we often get parents in those in those debates so that's what it's, i think it's starting at a very early age of uh, of taking away of like the choices they could have if right. they go down that road mm. road of following that it, it it limits but if they go down the choices of like studying hard and that mm-hmm. gives you more choices and as well and obviously there'll be obstacles in the way constantly you are challenged constantly it is quite hard i imagine growing up it was very different from my year of growing up the way young people it seems are like now. a different world. I think we were blessed to be growing up in that era, but then in that in those times, the older yeah. generation said that their era was the safer place to be. Yeah. But it's yeah. um, the advent of technology, and technology has yeah. been blamed for yeah. this I mean, good, horrible good state young people are in. Yeah, there's good and bad, good and bad that, mm. and obviously I'm using that technology. Of to course, the people. irony here. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I want to be able to do that. So. Um, this is it's one part of a huger process, you know. There's yes. a lot of societal issues about that, but this is a one element that we are tackling by doing something creative, uh, by by it's by young people made by young people, and it's their authentic voices that are coming. And that's through. the exciting yeah. part of this project. It's yeah. uh, by young people made by young people. They're taking yeah. ownership of their narrative, and yeah. if you give them that or ownership, that power, then you know that can really create some Clearly. very positive change that they're being heard yeah. and not being ignored. Now, um, this is not just the only project that you're doing. You're also mm. doing one with young Muslim females as well. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, inshallah. So this is something that you're working with uh, a, a very noted poet and writer that I know, Hafsa Anila Bashir. <laughs> yes, but very esteemed. And I think the introduction you gave to me is she's far beyond uh, talented than I am. And, and it's amazing that I've got the chance to, to work with Hafsa. I, I've known Hafsa quite, quite a few few years around the sort of the, the northern scene, shall I say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this kind of project came through somebody who was originally from Rochdale, uh, who's now gone off to be a professor. Um, and she does a lot of studies or, or around sort of, uh, she happens to be Muslim herself, female Muslim, um, Fazana. And uh, she got some uh, money to do hopefully a short film about this thing, about what is called change the narrative, in particular, what is the narrative about young female Muslim girls. Um, because she knew of me, the work I did, mm-hmm. and she wanted to do sort of bring a project back into Rochdale, mm-hmm. um, I thought being a male, that could be a barrier, working with young girls, because you want them to be open and have a really honest and open discussion. Mm-hmm. So I thought, right, um, I could, the best way to project manage is, is just have another artist, and Hafsa came up, and also another female uh, filmmaker, because thing is it's such a short time scale on this right. project often my projects uh have a nice sort of lengthy time so i can bed myself in with the kids knowing that them to be uh open and honest and get trust this is about a two month time scale it's a very short 
when it comes to doing a film project. So one of the things that we learned quite quickly was that the girls were quite resistant to be honest, uh, be mm. open and let me know some of their narratives, their stories. So there's a couple of times I kind of ducked out the session and half of the cover, which is great because then it, hopefully then we've got a, that safe platform where the young girls can be open and mm. honest, honest. It's about some of the things that the way they feel the media sees them or the community sees them mm. or the way they see themselves and being having a really open and honest discussion because hopefully this as a film could go to change makers or policy makers or even inshallah schools, inshallah because this to, like this narrative this rhetoric continuously for the last 10 years it just doesn't seem to stop that you know muslim yeah. women yeah. um under yeah. the microscope uh, which is getting yeah. kind of a little bit frustrating so i'm hoping that they do get an opportunity and they will do with somebody like hafsa and yourself yeah. to kind of get their voices out now i'm sure our listeners want to find out how can people connect with you Barvez? Uh, I do have a website. I don't know how I can link that to you guys if they want to, because all my films and all the work that I'm doing currently is on there. So that's the best way to get in touch so we can work out a way. Hopefully we can do that. It's got all my contact details on there. Fantastic. And the website is your name, isn't it, Brother Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, God did. Yeah. So um, now I want to quickly ask you, Provost, because we are heading off to a break. Now, um, we there will be a um, lots of young people and emerging yeah. theatre makers or writers listening into the show from Peterborough, Sheffield and Luton this morning. But I want to ask you, what tips could you give to any aspiring creative out there? Um, I would, depending on well, the age group, if they're quite young, if they're at school, get involved in like the drama projects. I mean, it might not be a case if you want to be in front of things. There might be things where you could be on the technical side. You can help because I'm always pushing for, you know, people from my community. Look, you don't always have to be in front of the camera. There are lots and lots mm. of jobs behind. There's producing, there's accounts, there's, di- uh, there's uh, computer, there's designing. There are lots and lots of um, opportunities because I think that's one thing we, we lack um, mm-hmm. in that sense is that we don't have enough representation. Um, so for me, I would see what local drama groups there are there. You can get involved in writing. Uh, you know, there might be a local theatre nearby you. They always usually have an arm of, of that local theatre where there might be a young company, there might be an elder. It's just mm-hmm. not only about young people. If you're slightly mature like me, there are places and opportunities. So it's just looking and Googling, I think, just what's in your local area. I think that's a good start, really. And, and online, there's BBC Writers Room. There's always opportunities. If you want to write something, you can send something off. Fantastic advice there. Folks, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to um, Pervez Gardner, who ha- is a professional actor for over 15 years. He's a, also a creative producer talking to us about some of the fantastic work he has done. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, oh, Pervez, you. having you join us today. It's actual thank National you. Pastry Day. So wow. w- what would you want? What would you opt for before you head to the before we head I, to the break? A typical northern thing is a cheese and onion one. <laughs> Couldn't say it better than yeah. that. Thank you so very much, Bravis, for joining no us this morning. It's Thank been an absolute you. pleasure. Thank you. Good uh, office. Thank you. Bye. That, that was the wonderful Bravis Carter talking to us not just about cheese and onion pasties, but also talking about some uh, great tips in the- uh, in acting and and theatre making, and um, sharing his journey of his tremendous work. Um, and I remember watching him in The Cops and Spooks. I wonder if you do. Um, uh, do join me straight after the break. I'm joined by another fantastic guest. It's Samaya Lee talking to us about her judging role at the Young Muslim Writers Award. Join me straight after this. Assalamu alaikum. Tune in and listen to Inspire FM every day to be motivated. Catch a creative vibe on the Urban Cube with Sister Shamiza. Good morning, good morning, good morning and assalamu alaikum. It's 11.30, that means it's the last half an hour of the Urban Cube show. Monday 9th of December and you're listening to me, Shamiza, on Where Else? Inspire FM. I hope you've had a, a, a wonderful start to the week, guys. You've had a, And I hope you've had a great weekend as well. It's been an interesting weekend. I found that the weather, the, the temperature had really dropped and it became quite bitter. And it really did make me think about um, the homeless community um, living rough on the street. So, um, 
Yeah, just really, really did make me think about that. Um, and um, But it has been quite wonderful to see lots of projects across the country that are actually kind of giving out um, free coats and sleeping bags and soup kitchens popping up and homeless sh- shelters kind of preparing themselves for the the uh, seasonal Christmas break as well, which is good to read about. So if there are any projects local to you, be that Peterborough, Sheffield, Luton surrounding areas, do tell us, do tell us what's going on. I like to keep people updated and informed because we're all about positively inspiring the community, guys. And it's all the community. It's not just one part, but all the community. We are one community. And um, this kind of leads me off on to the Be a Good Neighbour campaign, guys. Be a Good Neighbour campaign is something that Inspire FM is running across the next two weeks. And the whole purpose of Be A Good Neighbour campaign is to find out from you, what do you do that makes you a good neighbour? Do tell us whether it's a small or a large action. What is it that you do? Uh, Tell us on 07779481822. And I hear from the managers, there's actually a prize in it. Um, Not that we want you to be greedy, and reap the rewards. We want you to kind of naturally do a positive action, but um, it's uh, there. There is a uh, the best story gets a prize. I hear. So yeah, next two weeks. This is for the next two weeks. This is running, and it's the be Go- a good neighbor campaign. Now on today's show, we've had the pleasure of listening to some tremendous individuals who've made their mark locally, nationally, and internationally from stage, screenplay and theatre and giving you some great tips and advice on how to kind of motivate yourself as a writer if you're wanting to enter that world of writing, be that stage screen or screenplay or acting. Now, I'm joined by another wonderful guest whose name you may be familiar with because she has been a guest on a previous show, Marshalla, talking to us about her experience judging at the Young Muslim Writers Award, which was, I believe, last weekend or I think a fortnight to go. Now, the wonderful guest I'm speaking about is no other than the very tremendous Samaya Lee. Now, she is a former teacher and author of the story of Maha, which was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book Africa and longlisted for the Sunday Times Fiction Award. Thank you so very much, Samaya, for joining us this morning. Assalamu alaikum. Walaikum salam. Thank you so much for having me, Shemaiza. Always a pleasure, my dear. Always a pleasure. Now, my dear, um, it's National Pastry Day. That's the first thing I'm going to ask you. Um, <laughs> is there a particular pastry that you've come across? I know your your roots are from South Africa, so and that you would have in the morning in South Africa compared to what you have in London. Uh, not particularly, no, we're not a very pastry-oriented nation. I mean, obviously pastries have infiltrated <laughs> the southernmost tip of Africa, but um, pastries were always homemade uh, when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that you could buy in a shop, and it was always for special occasions, uh, like Eid or something like that. And um, so National Pastry Day, no, I should go out and get myself some pastries, I think. You're allowed to today. Don't hold off. Forget the calories. It's all about, you know, <laughs> pastries this morning. Or maybe you might want to take a box of page- pastries to your neighbours because we're doing okay. the um, Be Kind to Your Neighbour Day or Get to Know Your Neighbour Day. Do you know who your neighbours are, Samaya? Yes, of course I do. <laughs> I don't think I think it's almost humanly impossible to live in a way without uh, engaging with your neighbours. And I think as Muslims, we are morally obliged mm. to uh, reach out and, and make sure that our neighbours are people we know, people that um, don't have any needs, um, you know, that kind of thing. So. I, I find it really strange to live in an environment where people say that they don't know who their neighbours well, are. Well, I'm so pleased to hear that. And I love the fact that you 
have brought in the Islamic side of this um, because interestingly there are many people who don't know their neighbours. There are people who live on a street who may have passed by the person uh, living next door to them but have never connected with them. I find that so strange but we live in a time where people are kind of, there's lots of re- properties that are rented out so people come in, That's they go, true. come in, go um, yeah. and houses are vacant so people don't kind of build that community connection with their neighbours or we're just maybe frightened of communicating yeah. with somebody new. That's really, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's sad. That's actually really sad. Because when you're living, living in a space, um, you kind of need to know mm. um, who's around you and you need to engage. That's your, that is your community after all, isn't it? So it's kind of hard to have or feel like you belong if you're completely oblivious to everyone and everything around you. Um, yeah, that's sad. That is sad. But we want to bring happiness for this campaign <laughs> and you are bringing that happiness and the warmth into the studio this morning because, mashallah, Sameya, you've had the absolute pleasure to see beautiful, beaming, smiling faces at the Young Muslim Writers Award oh. as a judge for this very exciting event that happened. Was it a fortnight ago? It was, yeah, the previous Saturday. Yes. yes. The previous Saturday. So, um, yeah, one of many, many, many judges. And alhamdulillah, it's always so heartwarming to, um, to see so many writers that are involved <clears throat> involved in, in, in the Young Muslim Writers Award. It's actually, uh, this year was the ninth year. So next year is a big milestone, 10 years. Wow. Uh, promoting uh, writing and storytelling amongst the, the, the kids, the children, our future um, all around the country, and for them to actually make the effort um, to uh, enter um, the families that in, uh, encourage their children. I mean, that's always heartwarming mm-hmm. when you see parents mm-hmm. who made that effort to encourage their children to take part and then come all the way from wherever, you know, for the actual event and celebrate. It's, um, yeah, it's definitely something that, uh, for me, going, attending it, it's, it's something that um, inspires me. I find it really inspiring. Um, uh, to see that storytelling is still alive and uh, being nurtured. That's the main thing, being nurtured. And that, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? The fact that it's still continuously being nurtured. When the, the project is going into its 10th year next year, mashallah, it hasn't stopped. We're still seeing no. entries from across, across the country from children, Muslim children, bringing their, their stories forward. And have you Absolutely. seen, was there anybody or any win that was quite significant for you, Samaya? Um, what? Not, I wouldn't say one particular a thing was significant. I think what, what, what is significant is the fact that um, children, um, the younger ones and the older ones, are mm-hmm. writing across the board. They, they brave, they're writing bravely. They're writing in every genre mm-hmm. imaginable. They're writing mysteries. They're mm-hmm. writing fantasy. They're writing stories about magic. They're writing stories about real life. So um, for me, the range... Um, that everyone's not writing the same kind of story. For me, that's the most interesting thing and, and one of the more inspiring things as well. Um, but what I find um, a bit concerning but also is understandable is that with the younger children, in their stories, they're still using names of um, white people, men oh, and okay. Tom. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they're still not seeing themselves in that Interesting. Uh, role as the warrior or mm. the fairy princess. Mm. Or, um, and that's, that's basically a reflection of what they're reading. Um, when you're younger, you tend to, when you write uh, your early days, you, you mimic, you mimic what you, what you read. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's normal. That's a normal part of your development as a writer. But um, I think uh, when we have, because the Young Muslim Writers Awards host work, workshops, across the country as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think what, one of the things we need to encourage is uh, children uh, reflecting themselves, um, people like us, people of color, people uh, with faith that are in these stories as well. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I would call out, if any, any aspiring writers uh, are out there, a British, Muslim, uh, or even just British people of color, uh, to write for the younger children, mm-hmm. write stories for children, write stories for young adults, uh, teenagers, because 
um, the children in this country need to see themselves reflected yeah. in well, stories. We uh, have of all um, kinds. Sophia Ahmed. Um, yes. And yes. we have, have, have Zainab Mia have and Naima B. Robert. Yes. Yes, we have a handful. We have a handful. We need more. We need far, far, far We're more. We're seeing a lot um, more female Muslim writers coming forward. Are there enough Muslim men writers writing for children? I haven't come across... Um, I mean, there there have been one or two books that have kind of come and sort of uh, not really... Uh, gr- I don't know. They haven't really taken hold in mm, some way. Mm. But um, recently, this whole We Need Diverse Books uh, movement that started in in the U.S. Um, it's kind of come across to to the U.K., but it still hasn't. Um, yeah, it still hasn't taken a, a strong. It doesn't have strong roots here mm, yet, and mm. we still need more. Uh, obviously, publishing is is part of the problem, uh, where they have uh, sort of uh, what do you call them? Um, they they have uh, spaces for. Uh, diverse writers. They have spaces for uh, people uh, mm-hmm. who fall under the BAME category. Uh, but that's just like, it's, it feels almost uh, like they, they publish three books by uh, BAME writers and that's it. That they've done their d- duty for the year. Tick box. So there's, yes, tick box, exactly. So there's not enough. Um, yes, we, we definitely need to do more. And I think um, with the Young Muslim Writers Awards, what's interesting is that there's a it's, it's not uh, gender heavy. It's not only mm, females winning mm. or only females entering. Uh, you see lots of young boys and uh, 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 teenage boys as well writing and entering. And Which is that wonderful. is heartwarming because then you know that uh, we, one day we will get books uh, yes. <laughs> written by young men for yes. little boys uh, to inspire them and get them into reading and, and mm. help them to see themselves in reflected in, in stories. Definitely. Um, and what's interesting... About, Thing is, uh, sorry to uh, interrupt you there. No, no. Um, it was interesting that we've had Pervez Kadir, who is uh, an, a professional actor for, you know, across 15 years. And he'd been in a lot of um, the old television drama series. And he said mm-hmm. there was no representation where, of him. And he was tired of doing those stereotypical roles. And hopefully... Um, 2020 onwards we're going to see a change hopefully in the landscape of re-representation in books and film i'm hoping yes absolutely we we should definitely uh be making more of an effort uh for that for, for the future for the kids for them you know for them to be able to see um themselves reflected and not think that oh no it's only um white people who write and mm. only white characters in stories make a story interesting um we also have interesting stories to tell and you Um, are a somebody that has uh told an interesting story as a (laughs) uh uh, a notable author yourself your um debut the story of maha was shortlisted for the commonwealth writers prize for best first book africa and long listed for the sunday times fiction award um and uh, tell us a little bit more about this wonderful book that you gave me as a gift, I remember, signed yeah, by you <laughs> at the Young Muslim Writers Awards. <laughs> it was, it was, which is why I missed you. I really missed you this year. Um, well, that idea was, uh, that formulated when I was still a teenager. It took another 20 years before I actually sat down and wrote that story. But um, I think I've said this before that, uh, as a teenager reading The Secret Diary of Adrian Moe, mm. age 13 and three mm-hmm. quarters, which I found hilarious, mm-hmm. but also made me think, hey, we also have, you know, funny, interesting stories to tell. And in fact, if he thinks his life is hard, he should try living my life here because we're living under apartheid. Yeah. We've got all these other issues as a result of that. Mm-hmm. And I've got normal adolescence going on. So, um uh, yeah, so that idea was always brewing, and uh, so the story of Maha is literally the story of a mixed-race girl growing up Muslim in South Africa during apartheid with all the cultural issues that, that come from, um, uh, that we've inherited from our colonial masters, um, people in at the time, in the, set in the 70s um, mm-hmm. and 80s, and in the 70s, I think people still had very strong uh, colonial mentalities. Um, and uh, that infiltrates the way in which we uh, we conduct ourselves. And I think one of the things that really made me really angry um, in retrospect as a, as a young woman is um, the the way in which m- women are treated uh, in our communities, 
not because of the faith and not even because of our culture so much, but because of what we've uh, inherited from our colonial masters and all their warped notions of a woman's place and patriarchy. Uh, uh, Yes, patri- exactly, the patriarch. We inherited that. It's not part of us. It should never have been. We should have rejected it at the door, but unfortunately, it managed to seep in. And so we're still living. Um, I mean, even if I look at what I'm working on at the moment, um, the thing, uh, the, the underlying theme is this misguided notion that a woman shouldn't complain. You know, a woman's mm-hmm. voice should, always, should be, a woman should just suck everything up and walk with her head held high and act as though nothing is happening and not complain about um, any kind of difficulties that she's going through, especially abuse of any kind, whether it's uh, emotional abuse, psychological abuse. Um, and we don't even have to talk about physical abuse because mm-hmm. that's just obvious. But even in, that, even in these scenarios, we find women in our community, I'm talking about Muslim women, who are kind of subtly indoctrinated into believing that this is something that they should just shut up and put up with. Um, and so these, these are the things that make me angry and these are the things that make me so, right. So how can you turn this around? What would you say to turn this around, Samaya? Turn what around, uh, Shamaya? So the, this behaviour, so this attitude, um, the way women that you're seeing are being treated, what, what should be done? Well, I think... Um, uh, more conversations need to be had, maybe more discussions around these topics, maybe more books to be written. Samaya, are you still there? Oh, I think we may have lost her. Hello, Samaya. And on that note, <laughs> that was quite strange losing Samaya there. We will we will connect her back on the line, inshallah, because it is a live radio show and we are speaking to her over the phone. Now, guys, the time is 11.47. You're listening to me, Shamiza, taking you up to 12 o'clock. Not too long for the end of the show. Now, you can catch the repeat of the show, 8 p.m. this evening, and a podcast always goes out as well. I was just speaking to the very Awesome Samaya Lee, who is an author. She was born and raised in Durban, South Africa, and she worked as an Islamic studies teacher and um, and a Montessori directress. That sounds rather glamorous. A teacher of English as a foreign language, and her debut, The Story of Maha, was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers Prize for the Best First Book, Africa, and longlisted for the Sunday Times Fiction Award. Um, She's currently the undergraduate curriculum. Oh, it it is currently on the undergraduate curriculum at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I don't even know if I pronounced that properly. I will have to ask her. Um, Pronounce that for me properly. You're back. You're back, my darling. Where did you disappear to? I'm back. I don't know why you disappeared. KwaZulu-Natal. That's That's it. Which I am in South Africa. Um, You asked me a very important question. Yes. You got cut off. I know. (laughs) What's going on? Coming back to how we can create change in our communities to kind of provide that there is more representation and more discussions had on issues impacting women. I think women's voices, yes, definitely, there should be more. Um, I think conversations definitely need to be had. Um, it's a question of, of knowledge, of uh, mm-hmm. um, uh, the, uh, repelling ignorance with, with real uh, solid uh, knowledge that comes from our Quran and Sunnah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that uh, we have the beautiful story of uh, Khola anha in the in, uh, in the Quran and Hadith mm-hmm. where she went and complained to the Prophet Islam about her husband, mm-hmm. not about anything else, about her husband. Um, and Allah Himself uh, acknowledges this in the Quran and says mm-hmm. that He heard the woman who complained. If that is not enough to um, um, to, to give us a feeling within ourselves that our voices have value and that our voices matter and that our complaints are not uh, to be dismissed and trod upon just because we women, then I don't know what more we need. Mm. We need to stand up to these men who think that they can uh, silence us with these uh, ancient patriarchal notions that mm. have no place in our faith, no but- place. And there is a minority that do that, not the majority, mashallah. We do see a lot of brothers and men and fathers who are quite very forthcoming and very supportive of the women um, in their households. That is true. There is, there is a change. But I think the change also needs to happen within the women themselves because okay. we've been 
given, you know, we've been conditioned into mm -hmm. Uh, for such a long period that it takes a while to come to mm -hmm. come out of that anyway. But yes, of course, we have hope. We have that's why we have stories, Shemaiza, too. Of course. <laughs> so and you are part of something called Writivism. Tell me a little bit more about that. Writivism is um, it's an African based literary initiative that um, it's um, it's pan African, so mm -hmm. it's, it deals with writers from all across the continent, and the aim is to encourage uh, mm -hmm. voices from Africa. So we work with emerging writers on the continent, we um, link them up with um, established published writers on the continent and in the diaspora, um, and we get them to mentor each other. So we get the established writers to mentor the emerging writers. We also have an annual prize and festival, um, and the main idea is to, again, to, to, to create an environment where our stories can be told, where our stories can be heard, where um, our children can see themselves, um, can meet writers who look like them, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I went to the festival a few years ago, I remember when we did the school visits, visits um, a lot of the children were amazed that writers existed amongst people of color, that they were writers who were not white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, and that is not unusual because in schools they usually study the classics like Dickens mm. or um, uh, Jane Austen or whoever, and so they they're going to assume that everyone who's written a good book is a, wow. a white person who no longer exists. But um, so yeah, so that's the main aim of of writerism. Is we are seeing that. a slow shift at universities now, where um, decolonizing the curriculum. Yes. Um, how do you feel about exactly. that? Well, I think it's important to have a balance. I don't, um, we can't dismiss uh, the great uh, works that came before us uh, in other cultures. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I will not never um, uh, say that. But I do think we need a balance. So we need, while studying the classics and people who, who uh, they've always studied is, is important, at the same time we need to uh, balance that out with studying uh, other writers, writers mm. from, from Africa, from the Indo-Pak subcontinent, from South America, uh, great writers from all these different cultures and uh, places, um, because writing and through story is the quickest way of uh, learning about each mm. other. We can't travel the world and get to know each culture and each nation um, and each type of people. Um, uh, that's almost impossible unless you are, uh, you've dedicated your life to traveling. Uh, the quickest way to do that is to read stories by people that are not like you. Um, and that's how we develop empathy, and that's how we keep our humanity alive, so this understanding that the common threads of humanity exist regardless mm. of where you are in the world or what your faith might be. Um, and, and that's the beauty of story, really. Um, and I want to find out... It, oh, sorry. Hello. Um, you want to I out? wanted to find out from you, is there another book on the cards, Samaya? I am working on something. I am working on something. And that's, that's why I spoke about this notion about women mm. complaining, because mm. that's really the, 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 the one of the things that motivated me to write this um, current work that I'm working on. So do make dua that it all goes down. Well. Writing is not an easy process. Um, I wouldn't. <laughs> you have to. Uh, yeah, no, it's not an easy process. Well, it's. I, I look forward to an exclusive on the Urban Cube, but I would like to ask you, Samaya, um, what tips could yes. you give to any potential writers out there listening into the show this morning? Well, you mean um, guidance as far yeah. as writing is yes. concerned? Yeah. Of course. Uh, the first thing I would say is read, 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 read everything and anything you can get your hands on. Read things you like, read things you don't like, read all kinds, read as much as you can. You cannot create from uh, a void. Uh, you have to take in words to be able to produce words. Uh, so read, read, read. And then write, write. Uh, remember that writing, everything you write is not going to be uh, put for production and mm -hmm. put for the public uh, consumption either. But you have to write. Um, I always give the example of, um, what's his name? Oh, God, I can't even think of his name now. My fav favorite tennis player. <laughs> <laughs> There's loads. Uh, Roger Federer. Ah, I, I always, was about to say that, yes. yes. I always give the example of a tennis player that when you watch the match at Wimbledon, mm -hmm. you haven't seen all the thousands of balls that that yes. tennis player had to hit wow. before he actually can play um, on centre court. 
So in the same way, writing, when a book comes out, you, ha- you cannot see all mm-hmm. the thousands, in fact, millions of words that went before, yes. for years and years and years, before you could actually write and create something that can be oh. produced and can wow. be on. Samaya, my darling, I'm going to have to p- put this story to off. the end because we are now to the end of the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you join us this morning. Thank you so mer- very much. And I hope you'll join us with your new book. Thank you so much for having me, Shumaiza. Take care. All the best. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful Samaya Lee. And from me, Assalamu alaikum. Be good to your neighbours, guys. Run the campaign across next week and beyond. And from me, catch your repeat 8 pm this evening. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We stream our daily broadcast on inspirefm.org. You'll find all our daily updates on our social media at InspireFM Luton.